Uh, so, welcome to my TED Talk. This is Managing Custom Plugins and Components at Scale. Uh, I'm Matt Fields. You can find me on Twitter at 0x60617474. Uh, that is Matt in lowercase in, in ASCII in hex. It is also never taken anywhere, so that's very convenient for me, but it's also a little bit hard to remember. Um, but if you just remember Matt in ASCII and HEX, then you can translate and find me. Uh, you can also reach me at mafields at ncsu.edu, which is a little bit easier to remember. I uh, need to actually click on this so that we do the thing. All right, so a little bit about myself. I am a systems programmer at NC State. I started as a web developer back in 2009 when I was a student and did web development throughout my career at college. In 2016, I got hired as a full-time web developer and then in 2018, I moved to the systems group, and so I've mostly been doing things with infrastructure and uh, managing sysadmin type things since then. Um, I've been active in WordPress development for about seven years now, writing a lot of custom plugins and themes, uh, many of which are deployed across uh, NC State and are used by the majority, if not all, of our sites. So I have lots of experience doing that. Uh, I also designed a lot of the, the College of Engineering's WordPress infrastructure, how we lay out all of our multi-sites, um, a lot of the tooling and administration that we have around that, our permissions model, and things like that. And I mostly enjoy doing back-end stuff and integration. My front-end development chops are not something that I enjoy doing and don't really like to flex those muscles very often. Uh, we will touch on that a little bit later. So today's discussion, uh, we'll be taking a journey through how NC State uh, started doing custom deployments of plugins and themes, uh, and some of the things that we explored along the way and the uh, solution that we ultimately decided on. Uh, we will meet Cthulhu, which is always exciting. Uh, we'll talk about some of the available deployment options today and things that you can take advantage of, and we will have a shameless plug for a community project that I'm working on at the end of the session. Uh, I'll be moving a little bit fast because we have a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put them onto the website and I will answer them after the session and I'll also be hanging around after the fact for some more in-depth conversations if you'd like to have them. So going back to 2013, uh, NC State is first adopting WordPress as our CMS on campus. Uh, we are taking a bunch of hand-coded static sites and putting them into WordPress. And we've also just adopted GitHub Enterprise on campus, and so we're trying to use that to host all of our custom code, uh, adopting more best practices and trying to do things the right way. Uh, something to note about WordPress at NC State. Um, we talk to some people sometimes, and they think, oh, you have a single IT organization, and you offer a single WordPress service, and that is not how it is at all. Uh, each of our different colleges, sometimes each department within different colleges, has their own IT staff, and each of them is offering a different WordPress service that may or may not compete with other things. Uh, College of Engineering alone has 18 different instances that we deploy. Office of Information Technology has hundreds. I don't have a number on that. Um, other colleges do their own things. We also have uh, cPanel hosting where people kind of just do their own thing. We have people running servers under their desks that we have no idea what they are. People are starting to get into cloud computing and AWS and Azure and things. And so when you talk about deploying out to campus, you can't really talk about a single cohesive environment. It's hodgepodge, completely different and contextualized depending on what you're talking about. Totally great. Yeah. yeah, it works. <laughs> um, so back in 2013, we were using a single sign-on implementation called RAP. Uh, how many of you have heard of RAP? How many of you from NC, not from NC State have heard of RAP? <laughs> uh, so RAP was a plug-in to Apache 2.2, not compatible with 2.4, which was a fun upgrade. Um, and that was what we used for our single sign-on. Uh, it's pretty much, I think, NC State and two other universities at the time. I don't remember what they are. Um, but we were pretty much the only ones in the entire world using uh, this authentication system. And so when we made the move over to WordPress, we wanted to be able to use our single sign-on solution to have people uh, authenticate as they normally did. But obviously, there weren't any existing integrations. So we decided to write our first custom plugin, multi-auth, which allowed us to do that. Uh, we also wanted to keep the local WordPress username and password authentication for people that didn't have an authentication with RAP. And so we set out on our journey to write this plugin. We very early on decided not to publish this on uh, 
WordPress.org to the plugin repository for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main one being that no one else was ever going to use this, and so it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And for the people that got confused and thought that they wanted to use it, we didn't want to provide support to them. And we also felt a little nervous about publishing the source code for our authentication plugin out on the open web. So for these and many other reasons, we decided we're not going to publish it on WordPress.org. We'll just handle the deployments manually. What could go wrong? <laughs> and so uh, all of our uh, initial development was finished, and we had our working plugin, and we had it tested locally, and it was time to push it out to all the sites. And so we went on to our GitHub instance, and we clicked download as zip. And we had a lovely zip file that we could upload to each and every single one of our sites. And then we sent emails out to other people that said, hey, this is available. You go to this GitHub URL, and you click on download zip. And you, too, can upload a zip file to each and every single one of your sites. <laughs> and so people did that, and they activated the plugin, and it worked. And mission accomplished. Everything was great. And it only took, like, two weeks. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had a critical update. Um, so I don't remember the specifics of it, but it was something simple like a uh, regular expression that excluded certain users, and so they couldn't log in. Um, it was a very simple fix, but it was affecting users and causing tickets to come in. So we applied the quick fix, and we pushed out the update, and then we had to tackle the problem of updating all of our sites. And so very similar to installing on all the sites, we went out to GitHub, we downloaded, we uploaded. And this is where things started to get very messy, where um, with, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but back in 2013, the name of the zip file, if everything was in the top level uh, directory under the zip file, the name of the zip file is used as the plugin slug when you upload it. And so people who had already downloaded this plugin and still had that in their downloads directory, they had the same plugin with a one in parenthesis at the end of it. And so when they uploaded that, they now have two copies of our plugin active on their site. Um, <laughs> we also were kind of lazy and we didn't bump the version number. So uh, it was kind of difficult to determine which site was running which version. And the whole thing was kind of a mess and took a long time for us to figure out. And uh, we were having these problems locally within engineering. And I think everywhere else across campus was also dealing with similar things. But I didn't really talk to them at the time. So I didn't know what they were doing. Um, and we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could just push updates like we could with WordPress.org? We just publish it to the repo. And it's available as an update. People one click, and it's done. Wouldn't it be nice? So then we started to get really complicated. We start. We said, you know what? Doing uh, plain old PHP templating to do UI work is kind of gross. So there's this thing called Twig, and it's awesome, and we're going to use it. So we're going to pull that in as a dependency. We're going to do things with fancy JavaScript libraries. We pull in NPM. We're going to have a build chain. We're going to do asset compilation. We're going to actually engineer all of these things into our plugin. We had make files to do all of the build tooling, and we ended up with this a uh, very long how to install.txt because it was no longer just go and download the zip file from GitHub. You had to clone it off of GitHub, make sure that your build tools are installed on your machine, run the build process, zip up everything. Oh, make sure that you delete the node modules directory because it's enormous and it's not really useful. Um, and so now our process was starting to get more complicated. And so throughout all of this, we found five major issues that we kept running into when we were trying to do manual deployments. The first is that self-service installs are really uh, complicated and inconsistent. If you have to give your administrators an instruction booklet for how to install your plugin, the chances of them successfully installing that plugin go way down very quickly. Uh, the second is that automated updates don't work, or you have to bake that as custom code into your plugin or theme. And that's doable, but you end up having to manage yet another piece of code that doesn't have anything to do with your actual functionality. Um, and as we talked about earlier, uh, there's other problems that can arise. Even if they get all of the things correct and upload the zip, uh, the name of the zip file can cause problems. Uh, there's ways around that, but we didn't know that at the time. Uh, packaging from source. The how to install.txt is really annoying and ideally shouldn't even be a thing. There should be a one-stop place that people can just go get the plugin and have it installed and not have to worry about, do I have the right version of NPM installed on my desktop? 
Um, we also had issues with limiting access. So there were cases on campus where one unit would do for pay work for another unit on campus. And so only that particular unit should be allowed access to the plugin or theme. And so trying to build in limiting access either on the GitHub side of things didn't really work out very well because um, we didn't have a lot of adoption of GitHub at the time and trying to bake it into the plugins and themes themselves, trying to do some kind of like licensing thing just got very awkward and we really didn't want to have to deal with it. And finally, we found that all the problems scaled with the number of deployments. So when we were doing this in testing, um, just on a single server with a single plugin for a single uh, target audience, it was not all that bad and we could work through it. As we started to do more plugins and had more sites and the uh, problem factor scaled exponentially, we found that all of the other things also scaled up exponentially. And we soon had a bit of a mess on our hands. So some of the options that we explored during this time, uh, the first one was just deal with it. Uh, write down a process for how to do it and suck it up and hope that it works. We didn't do that for very long. Um, we tried doing the per plugin update systems. So we had a snippet of code that would say, my source code is on GitHub and here's how I can check for new versions. Um, our version of GitHub Enterprise is running in private mode. So the only way to access it is through authentication tokens. So then you have to manage those, or we had to write a different service that would check in with GitHub on its behalf and uh, copy and paste that from one plugin to the next. And keeping up with that as a dependency was really annoying. And so we decided this probably isn't the best way to go forward with this. What else can we do? It was then that we discovered the holiness that is GitHub Updater. And it seemed to be a silver bullet for all of our problems. We could say, this is the source for the uh, repository on GitHub. It will actually go and install it for you, which was awesome. Uh, it would go and do automatic updates built in with all of the normal WordPress uh, update systems. And everything seemed to be glorious. But there were still some features that we missed from the WordPress.org functionality, namely the ability to search for things and have one-click installs without having to know where they were coming from. So especially at the time, um, I haven't kept up with GitHub Updater recently, but I think this is still the case. Um, you have to tell GitHub Updater, this is the repository that I want to manage and install. This is the repository for this plugin. This is the repository for this plugin. And so you kind of have to have this omniscience of what plugins are available and tell it, these are the ones that I want installed. There's no way to say, I want a plugin that does X, and then you get a list of everything that's available. Um, and that functionality, particularly for more of our end user managed sites where we're not really managing the plugin and theme installations, that was something that we were really missing from the default WordPress.org repository things. So we decided to explore some other options um, other than GitHub Updater. So instance management systems, uh, those are things like infinite WP and main WP that kind of sit off to the side and uh, lord over all of your WordPress sites and act as kind of like a command and control center. Um, you can utilize that to do uh, push out and deployments of plugins. So you can upload a zip to uh, your command and control, and then that'll actually push them out to everything that it manages. So that alleviates a lot of the problems similar to what uh, GitHub Updater does, but you're the one who's managing all of that at that point but we still lose a lot of the things like um, the ability to search for things and users to do self-installs. Because these instance management systems have full administrative rights over your entire systems, you can't give end users the ability to access those to do plugin installs, or at least at the time you couldn't. I'm not sure if they have more advanced permissions models now. Um, but so that was a little bit, that was infinitely better than doing things manually, but it still didn't check all of the boxes that we wanted. So after we had explored all of these options, we decided we are an engineering school. Let's build something to solve the problem. And so we did. So meet Cthulhu, uh, one of my more prideful uh, contributions to the university is something named after an eldritch god. Uh, so Cthulhu is a plugin and web service combination that uses the native WordPress installation and update capabilities to manage deployments of custom plugins and themes. So in other words, it is a plugin that you install onto your site that communicates with a web service that acts as a repository for all of your plugins and themes. It essentially mirrors the functionality that WordPress.org provides, but it's hosted locally on campus 
And so we can put things in there that we don't want published on WordPress.org. And the end result is that it's completely transparent to the end users. Um, in the WordPress view, you can, you can browse and search for plugins just like you can when they're coming from WordPress.org. Uh, you have your one-click install option. So you just click install and it goes and installs it. It integrates seamlessly with the built-in update mechanisms. So people just see that there's updates available. Uh, and most of the time, people didn't actually even know that they were consuming plugins from NC State and not from WordPress.org. So we actually put a little icon uh, over on the right there that denotes that it's actually coming from Cthulhu um, cool. to kind of make that a little bit more clear. On the developer side of things, uh, developers can integrate with GitHub using webhooks. And so they just push code to their repository. That triggers a build in the web service. And it will take all of their code. It will run any kind of composer or NPM compilation stuff. Uh, if there is a make file that exists, then it will just execute the make file. So you can kind of define your own uh, build chains and things. Uh, when we first started, we only had a single uh, update channel. So it was either in Cthulhu or it wasn't. And we started seeing that people were wanting to do uh, multiple deployments for production, staging, and development. And so we added additional channels. So you could say that the production channel comes from some stable branch in our repository, and the development branch might come straight from master. And so when you push to master, then it will just build uh, new builds on the uh, development channel. And then in the client plugin, you can specify that this entire site should pull all of its updates from the production channel or the development channel. Or you could say that this particular plugin we want to pull from uh, one of those three channels. So that allowed us a lot of flexibility in how we push out all of our deployments. We also have a build history and deployment stats and all kinds of information in the web service so that a developer can log in and see how many people are actually using my plugin um, and how many times has it been downloaded. We also added uh, access limitation via access codes. So the web service will generate a, a static access code that you have to have in the client in order to access any of the packages that are in that repository. So that solved our problem for someone has a for pay plugin on campus that they want to distribute, but only to their clients. They can securely give their clients the access code. And then because they know the access code, they can get access to it. So revisiting all of our original problems, uh, this was kind of our silver bullet where we no longer had to worry about any of these things. Uh, all of our self-service installations worked exactly like they do in WordPress. You just click and install it. Uh, automatic updates are handled through the normal WordPress mechanisms. Uh, packaging is handled because the service will actually go and run all of your build tools and spit out a zip for you. You can do limiting access through the access codes. And since all of those other problems are now taken care of, we no longer have problems that scale with the number of deployments. As long as we can install the Cthulhu plugin on the instance, then it kind of unlocks this whole world of custom plugins that are just available and you don't have to worry about them anymore. So like anything, you have pros and cons to any system. Um, the major pros of our system are that it solves our problems. And plugin authors don't have to worry about the extra problem of, well, how am I going to update this? Or how am I going to make this available? How can people find my plugin? Uh, they can focus more on what their plugin or theme does and just do that very well. And then the Cthulhu system abstracts out the concern of uh, installation and updating. It uses the native WordPress interface. So you don't have to retrain any of your end users on how to use this system. If they know how to use WordPress and install plugins, they already know how to do everything that they need to do to get uh, plugins and themes from you. Uh, it also doesn't require, require plugins to be active to update. This is something that constantly annoyed me about the uh, licensed plugins that we were running, is that if they're deactivated, then the snippet of code that they communicate with their uh, source doesn't run. And so you can have a plugin that's sitting on your server deactivated for months, and it's not getting updates. And then when you turn it back on, it's now out of date and is a potential attack vector. So because Cthulhu is managing all of the other plugins that it knows about on the service, it will continue to update those even if that particular plugin is not activated. So as long as the Cthulhu plugin itself is activated, then it'll update everything else. Uh, we usually have this uh, network activated across all of our sites. And so it doesn't actually even appear to most of our end users. And so it's completely invisible. 
Uh, the last one, overriding update functionality. This can either be a pro or a con, depending on how you use or abuse it. But Cthulhu will inject itself as the very last source of updates in the uh, update transient. And so it will actually override, uh, if there's another update mechanism for another plugin, it will override that mechanism. And so we use this in the past for if there is a critical vulnerability in a plugin that's on WordPress.org, then we have the ability to clone that down locally, make a patch, put that into Cthulhu, and then push that out to all of our uh, sites before the plugin author has had a chance to deploy that on WordPress.org. Um, and then, or if there's a piece of functionality that that author refuses to add or something, then we can add that ourselves and we can deploy that out. Uh, if we remove it out of Cthulhu, then it'll update from WordPress.org as it used to. Um, we also abuse this a little bit to make our lives easier with licensed plugins. Um, we're absolutely not trying to take advantage of uh, plugin authors that offer for pay plugins. Uh, we always get site licenses whenever we can, but it's a bit of it's a bit of a task to make sure that licenses always get applied across every single instance on campus. And in some cases, you have end users who are running that that might be tempted to take that license and run it on private things. Um, so what we can do with Cthulhu is we can have a single instance of that plugin with a license applied and then push all of the updates that are applied from that single instance into the, the Cthulhu system and deploy those updates out across our entire uh, suite of sites. So it greatly simplifies the ability to manage licensed plugins um, just by removing the fact that we need to have a license in order to update them across that. Uh, some of the cons. Um, it is maintenance of a web app. So this was custom code that we wrote, and so we have to maintain it. And as PHP upgrades come through and as the WordPress ecosystem changes, that's a cost that we have to take on to make sure that that web app continues to run and continues to be uh, uh, compatible with uh, current day WordPress. And it does require the initial plugin installation of the Cthulhu plugin. So it doesn't completely take away uh, every single one of those problems, you do have to get the Cthulhu plugin initially onto the site before it can start to work. And so you have to do that one time manual deployment. Uh, the good thing about it though is the Cthulhu plugin will update itself after it's installed. And so you don't have to worry about manually updating it. You just have to get it onto the system initially. So that was our journey through uh, custom plugin deployment. Um, we tried out a bunch of things and eventually decided on building something that solved all of our problems. Um, let's talk about some of the things that are available today that people can take advantage of. You'll notice that this list looks strangely similar to the one that we explored back in 2013. Um, so the biggest thing that I would say, if you can at all do it, is eliminate the need to have this problem. So if you scale down the number of instances that you have, so if you're only running a single instance of WordPress, then the magnitude of this problem greatly diminishes. Uh, if you're not doing any custom plugin deployment or theme deployment, then you don't have this problem. So if you can eliminate the need to do that, then do so uh, for everyone else. Um, if you have a hosting provider that offers a service that does something like this, I believe that Pantheon has something where you can upload code to a repository, and then they'll push it out across your instances. Um, uh, NC State has all of our stuff hosted uh, on campus, and so we don't take advantage of hosting providers, so this wasn't really an option for us. But if you can take advantage of it, then I highly recommend that you do so. Uh, you can always deal with it. You can have a manual process and just make sure that you stick to it and try not to uh, falter on the path. Don't recommend that one. You can do per plugin update systems. Uh, if you have a small number of plugins and you have a good dependency management workflow, then you can abstract that out into a dependency for your plugin. And then it's kind of just an update once and push it out across everything. But as you start to get more and more and more plugins, then that can start to get a little bit unwieldy still. Uh, GitHub Updater is still around and still does its thing. Uh, most of the uh, pros and cons that I mentioned before are still applicable to the version that's running today. There's a new player uh, that's taking the same space called WP Pusher. Um, I haven't really played around with it very much, but I know some other units on campus were taking a look at it as a possible uh, option, but I don't really have a lot of experience, so I can't really talk about it. Um, and you can always do custom development like what we did with Cthulhu 
it's guaranteed to solve all of your problems because you built it to solve your problems, but you do have to take on the maintenance overhead of actually running that service and keeping it up to date. Um, and so that brings me to my final thing, which is my shameless plug for a community project. So for a very long time, I've wanted to take the Cthulhu system, which is very localized to NC State and only used by us, and bring it out into the WordPress community at large so that other people can start to take advantage of that service. Uh, and so this is the starting of that community project. Uh, it's on GitHub at github.com slash magnetic labs slash obsidian. Um, I'm awkward with names, so that is what it is for now. I'm open to <laughs> suggestions. Um, we're looking for contributors and people interested in testing the system. So if I was rambling about Cthulhu and that sounded like the best thing ever and you want it on your campus, um, then the Obsidian project is the open source implementation of that. Uh, I'm actually looking to uh, deprecate the Cthulhu system on campus and have NC State start using this project um, instead of it to further foster the growth of that project. So currently, um, it's still a little bit in its infancy. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm not a front-end developer, and so there is no user interface for this currently. There is only an API. Uh, so one of the things that I'm particularly looking for are people that are interested in doing UI work and designing a user interface uh, on top of the API. Um, as far as the functionality of the service itself, it has most of its core functionality in that it has multi-tenancy, so you can have multiple units on campus uh, all in the same bucket but separated out. Uh, you can register packages and have them built off of your GitHub repositories, and it will do all of the processing and things uh, and spit out your zip archives. Um, some of the more advanced features like uh, tracking of instances and doing uh, limited access aren't there yet. Uh, there's things like Slack integrations and uh, some more advanced features that the Cthulhu system currently does that I haven't had a chance to put into this system yet, but they are on the roadmap, and so they will be there eventually. Um, so if that sounds like something that you're interested in, then please come and talk to me uh, after the session, and we will talk. And I actually went through this much faster than I thought. So uh, we do have time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, then feel free to ask. If you don't want to ask, then you can put them on the website. Yes. So um, is this Apache dependent? Or is, it, is there anything in there that's dependent on? Uh, not as far as I know. Um, the There's a. Docker stack that we're using in <coughs> development that I think runs on Nginx. Okay. So if you're running Nginx, then that should be fine. Yes? Uh, could you look into any situations where you have like an instance of WordPress that you needed to provide updates to that was like on a repo already, like on GitHub or Pandium, you mentioned that you're, they're not allowed to go to straight to production. Mm -hmm. uh, did you send like email alerts to that if what would be that type of solution? Uh, so the question was that you have a site um, that exists that you can't push directly, uh, you can't directly push updates to. Uh, is there a mechanism that you can send an email alert or something like that? Um, there's not something currently that we have uh, that does that, um, and so it's not something that was accounted for in our system, um, but that would certainly be something that could be integrated in as a uh, email to an administrator that there's updates available on this site. Um, also, because all of this integrates with the default uh, WordPress update mechanisms, anything that you have that uh, exists to alert administrators that there are, say, core updates or things that are coming off of WordPress.org, whatever mechanisms or processes you have for that should also work with a system like this because it integrates directly. Um, tools like uh, WPCLI also seamlessly integrate. So you can say, uh, WPCLI uh, plugin install and then the slug of something that's in uh, your private repos and it'll just install it because it knows about it. Yes? So do you, with the system, then do you enforce, you enforce auto update or do you let the administrators update that well? Uh, it's entirely up to the administrators. Question was, do you enforce auto update or let people update at will? Um, the problem space that we're really trying to solve here is to get custom plugin and theme deployments to work as close to WordPress.org as they can. Um, and so we don't want to enforce any kind of opinions 
about how to do any of those kinds of things. Uh, so whatever processes you have for doing things off of WordPress.org, it'll work the exact same way in a system like this. So if you choose to do automatic updates, then it'll just work. If you choose to do manual updates, then you can do that as well. Any other questions? Yes. How long did it take you to build it? Um, so that's a, it's a tricky question. Uh, the question was, how long did it take to build it? So the initial deployment of Cthulhu uh, back in 2013 uh, took about three weeks, I think, to get a very rough first pass implementation that worked. And then we've been steadily adding features to it and doing quality of life improvements and things like that um, ever since then. I think the last update that we did to it was in 2017, so it's been a little bit of time. Um, the Obsidian project uh, I started working on in earnest about uh, six weeks ago, kind of just working on it in my spare time. So if you're looking, if you have a dedicated group of people that have actual time to work on something like this and you want to build a version of it yourself in house, then it shouldn't take a lot of resources to get something off the ground. Um, but then you'll want to continuously invest in it and improve it and give it care and love over time. Yes. So uh, you talked about this product as something that presents the, your custom plugins and themes alongside of what's in the WP.org repository. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that some people might have a problem with allowing administrators to just download whatever plugin from the WP repository that you can watch them mm -hmm. on the site. Mm -hmm. So does the, the does, does this limit the amount of plugins that they can see from the public repository in any way? Or even, or, or does it all go through your system? So excellent question. Uh, question was, does this limit the plugins or themes that you can see in any way, or can people still get things off of WordPress.org? Um, for the Cthulhu system, we actually have something uh, that's called strict mode. When it's enabled by an administrator, it actually locks it down so that only plugins and themes that are in the Cthulhu system are available for installation. Cool. And so it's a great way to say, I trust you to install stuff, but not that much. <laughs> um, and so it's a feature that I'm looking to add to the Obsidian project as well, but it's not something that's currently available. Cool. Okay. Anybody else? Are there plans to allow for multiple remotes? Um, by that I mean, if there are three different, essentially, app stores mm -hmm. that I want to allow, um, is that something that Obsidian <laughs> is looking, it already has on its roadmap? Uh, so question was, are there multiple sources uh, that uh, Cthulhu or Obsidian can pull from, or does it have to be a single source? Um, so the current way that Cthulhu works is you register individual repositories, and you can order them in order of preference, uh, with the WordPress.org repository always being last on the list. Um, it doesn't. The only thing that uh, consists for a repository is a URL, and so as long as it can talk to that uh, URL over HTTP, then that's all that you need to have it register a repository. So you can have multiple instances of this system running in separate deployments. Uh, wherever you want, and as long as they're each reachable uh, by your WordPress deployments, then it'll just treat each of the repositories as separate repositories. It doesn't care where they are or where they came from. Yes? How many plugins are being managed by this service, and are there orphans? In other words, are there plugins that, of that group of plugins, are there a subset that aren't being managed, and, and or do you know about, would you know about the case? Sure. So question was uh, about how many plugins are being managed by the system, um, I assume for NC State. Yep. Uh, and is there a way of detecting orphans that are no longer managed that might be installed? Um, so I think we currently have about eight or 10 different units on campus that are all putting uh, custom development into this project um, and hosting things there. Uh, each unit has between two or 20 different plugins and themes that are hosted in there. Um, obviously, some units are more active than others because they do more development. Um, but all told, I would say probably 
between 150 to 200 uh, custom plugins and themes are currently active in the system uh, just for our usage of it. And uh, in the Cthulhu plugin, there's an option that you can, as an administrator, go in and run a one-time lookup where it will go and scan all of the plugins that are installed on the system. It will see if those exist on WordPress.org and it'll tell you if they do. And it'll check to see if it's in any of the repositories that it manages and it'll tell you if you do. And then it will flag any of the remainder ones. So you can very quickly see this one's at WordPress.org, this one's managed by us, and this one, we don't know, maybe it was manually installed somehow and it's not managed anymore. Uh, and we're looking to bring pretty much all of the feature set that currently exists in Cthulhu also into the Obsidian project. So that would be something that would be available. Any other questions? All right. Well, if you think of anything, uh, then you can always post them onto the website, and I will answer them after the fact. And I will be around uh, at lunch if you want to come up and have a conversation. So uh, this is my contact information again. Find me on Twitter or email me. And you can also contact me there directly if you have any more in-depth conversations that you want to have. So awesome. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.